but not least, our other second place uh, winner was Chad Osorio, who was a PhD candidate at Vanenegan University in the Netherlands. Uh, he's also a senior lecturer at the University of the Philippines in Los Banos, uh, teaching intermediate environmental economics and economic analysis of law and regulation. He's a passionate academic and lawyer economist advocating for human and environmental rights. And his paper was titled, Battling the Illegal Wildlife Trade Through Regulatory Finance, the Southeast Asian Context. Chad, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Tom, and uh, thank you everyone for having me today. I'm really glad to be here to talk about a lot of very interesting topics on Hawala and, um, and gold in Suriname. And uh, Alex mentioned the resource curse today. So as a brief introduction, uh, I'm Chad. And as a researcher, I focus on criminal, the criminal element from criminal psychology to uh, international criminal justice to um, the economics of crime. And today I focus Can on- Can you go into presentation mode, please, with your ah. presentation? Uh, okay. It's easier to okay. see for the audience. Yes. One Thank moment. you so much. Sure. But screen two. Does this work? How does this work? Looks great. This is this is okay now. Okay. So I th thank you, um, Thomas. So my focus is basically on the on the economics of crime, and in particular the economics of environmental crime. And this is why today I'm going to be talking about the illegal wildlife trade and regulatory finance. So I will be taking twenty minutes of your time to talk about four things. First would be the social harms of the illegal wildlife trade, where I'll be talking about the scale of the damages globally and within the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Second, let's talk about the measures against illegal wildlife trade. What are the existing legal interventions against IWT? Third, let's talk about regulatory finance. Where does um, uh, money laundering laws, anti-terrorist financing laws come in? And what can they do? How can we use these existing legal frameworks to prevent the illegal wildlife trade? And lastly, I'll talk about the next steps. What are the, my current projects and potential areas where we can work together from different fields, um, from medicine to international relations to philosophy to, um, to finance in order to help prevent the illegal wildlife trade? But first, let's talk about why is it important? Why, why should we even talk about the illegal wildlife trade? And for many people, this topic is not really something which easily comes to mind. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't have a tiger at home. Um, or, and I don't, use a, I don't have, keep exotic ornamental plants. Uh, so for a lot of us, we don't really care about it. But as we will see... Um, there are a lot of harms of the illegal wildlife trade, which affects each and every one of us, even directly or indirectly. And I outline this based on three things, the political, uh, the, econo the environmental, the economic, and the social political harms. But before we get there, let's talk about what illegal wildlife trade is. When we talk about wildlife trade, it includes all sales of exchanges of wild animals and plants. And wildlife trade is normally legal except it becomes illegal if something is banned, meaning that we cannot trade it from um, within or across countries, or it goes beyond the limits imposed by laws and regulations. There's a limit, there's a standard, and we, have, we went beyond that limit. And whether legal or illegal, it is one of the most profitable businesses in the world. Legal wildlife trade amounts to 119 billion US dollars every year, and illegal wildlife trade amounts to approximately 20 billion every year. And according to um, Kim, only illegal, weapon, only illegal drugs, weapons smuggling, and human trafficking are more profitable. So in the scale of all illegal trade activities, it's up to four. But a lot of people, again, does not, do not realize how important it is and how it affects, how it impacts so many different aspects of our lives. So what are its impacts, basically? Well, first and foremost, it's biodiversity. We talk about illegal wildlife trade. It puts 33% of all birds and mammals at risk worldwide. 
with more than 950 species. And for a lot of um, animals which have high international trade, it significantly reduced species abundance by 65.8%. And it's not just about environmental harms, because these environmental harms cascade to economic impacts like agriculture, forestry, and fisheries. So think about bees, think about wolves in forests, think about the different kinds of marine animals that we have, which um, impact all of these uh, services uh, that are related to these industries. It can also facilitate invasive species takeover, which we know is also not good for all of these industries. At the same time, there are indirect impacts, well, direct and indirect, for example, tourism and the death of elephants, or even the life sciences. Think about pharmaceuticals, think about um, the bio, the life sciences, because 80% of um, a lot of the medicines of the pharmaceuticals we consume are actually derived from nature. And this is why it's very important that we look at the environmental and economic impacts of the illegal wildlife trade. But more than that, there's also the connection with the social and political harms that IWT brings. And what are these? Well, first of all, the social harms, the risk of zoonotic diseases. I'm sure you're familiar with um, something very recently which happened, um, uh, a global pandemic, um, which is the COVID-19 virus, which is said to have come from bats. But interestingly, the same variant of that virus is also present in pangolins. And pangolins are the most trafficked mammals in the world. So it could be another pandemic waiting to happen. At the same time, when we talk about political impacts, IWT is not a standalone crime. We talked about human trafficking, we talked about um, weapon smuggling, and IWT, the trade routes that they use are similar to the trade routes that, uh, that um, these other illegal trade uses. At the same time, illegal trade in natural resources um, can fund political and military insurgencies. So we see even if we're not necessarily, we don't necessarily have um, a jaguar in our living room or you know, use exotic plants as medicines, it can affect us whether directly or indirectly. And as we see here in the world over, this is a huge problem. We have millions and millions of dollars worth of um, imports from a lot of different countries and one particular region which I focus on today, excuse me, which is Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is um the Association of Southeast Asian Nations is a combination, uh, is a is an association of um 10 countries from that area, uh, which uh, banded together because of similar goals and also similar um, environmental, economic, and social, political, cultural concerns, and this is important because so ASEAN as a group, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, is the fifth largest economy in the world. It also um, it also poses uh, it also poses twenty five percent of the global wildlife trafficking, with numerous endangered species being sourced from this region. In fact, seventy nine percent of China's legally sourced wildlife. Um, imports come from just three countries, Indonesia, Laos, and Malaysia. So really, it's um, very important to look at the impact of illegal wildlife trade in this particular region. Yet despite the gravity and breadth of the, the problem and the breadth of it in this region, there is a glaring lack of analysis, studies, and projects. And this is why um, in this paper, we proposed, well, I proposed to look at, uh, to look at all of these areas. So now that we see that there's a huge problem about this, what are the legal measures currently in place before we give recommendations on how to improve them? They're based from the uh, incentives and enabling conditions. We have three areas wherein we can focus or we can divide the interventions. First one would be supply side measures. Second one would be uh, demand side measures, and then third one would be transactional measures. So when we talk about supply side measures, that means um, handling supply side, meaning increased patrols in wildlife habitats, enhanced border control, even improved wildlife investigation and prosecution and conviction rates. So all of these are meant to help um, lower the supply coming from indigenous and local communities 
to the global market. But at the same time, we also have demand side measures. And these demand side measures now target consumers. So that means public awareness campaigns, education and outreach initiatives, strengthened regulations and enforcement, mere, pos mere, mere uh, sale and possession of uh, illegal wildlife trade outlet, uh, out items, and also even synthetic alternatives, promotion of synthetic alternatives. So instead of, you say, using rhino horn to, include, to increase virility in men, they could use um, a synthetic product. So all of these things from uh, supply side and demand side measures are present and are being implemented right now. But as we can see, it still remains a billion dollar problem all around the world. And this is why we have to look at another side of the coin. We have to explore other potential answers to this problem. And that could mean transactional measures. As U.S. Federal Prosecutor Marcus Asner says, any illicit trafficking operation, whether you know wildlife or blood diamonds, it could be gold, or it could even be um, anything, basically, the resource course, it involves a supply side, a demand side, and a flow of money. And this is the basis of the recommendations that we will propose, that we will talk about today. So we go on to the brunt of the paper, to the main need of the paper. And we're talking about regulatory finance. These are um, the proposed interventions against the illegal wildlife trade that, are, uh, that uh, I've written in my paper based on uh, international law um, and also sound principles in economics, but focused on Southeast Asia. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take best practices from all of these different areas um, and also organizations and see how can we apply this, uh, these, um, uh, these solutions which have worked into the perspective of, uh, of a developing nation. And some of these examples include U.S. versus Vengis and U.S. versus Rafael. These are two fisheries cases where in, instead of using environmental um, law to, uh, to imprison and to, to, well, to prosecute um, environmental criminals, they use tax laws instead and they use money laundering laws instead. Operation Thunderball is another is a joint initiative by the World Customs Organization in order to help uh to to help countries prevent the illegal flow of wildlife and of course the Financial Action Task Force for Illegal Wildlife Trade, wherein they issued specific recommendations to improve um uh financial laws against illegal wildlife trade. So these are some of the examples that are very that have been successful in the past all across the globe, and now we apply them into the context of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And how do we now do that? Well, we have, I have three recommendations in this paper. First, strengthen existing implementation of financial crime instruments. Second append wildlife crimes as predicate offenses to financial crimes. And third, provide ample financial support to community initiatives battling IWT. And I will argue that all of these three things, which are part of regulatory finance, can also help bolster not only um, the battle against illegal wildlife trade, but also working together with communities, with the people on the ground in order for them to become key allies in the fight against this illicit trade in wildlife. Let's talk about the first. With the first um, recommendation is uh, would be strengthening existing implementation of financial crime instruments. And this is what we have in the ASEAN. You have um, 10 countries and you have all of these laws related to money laundering and anti-terrorist financing. And the thing about it is that Sometimes we might not even need to create new laws specifically, especially since all 10 countries in the ASEAN are already parties to the Convention on the uh, Trade of Endangered Species, which is on the International Trade of Endangered Species, which is CITES. 
um, and also have their own respective illegal wildlife laws. It's great that we can use existing money laundering and anti-terrorist um, financing laws in order to bolster the application of these wildlife laws to prevent, uh, to prevent illegal wildlife trade. What does this mean, basically? Well, first, um, we talk about standardizing IWT as a pred. Uh, we, we first talk about using that as um as means to prosecute criminals. And second, we talk about also standardizing IWT as a predicate offense. What does this What does this mean when we when we put something as a predicate offense to um AMLA plus ATF crimes? What happens basically is that it the, the penalties increase. And when these penalties increase, they actually serve as heavier disincentives for individuals to engage in illegal wildlife trade. Why is it necessary for them to, to increase penalties? Well, precisely because we want to um we want to um make them disengage from these practices. And doing so, increasing heavier penalties and ensuring that the leaders of these um the, the leaders of these organized crime syndicates get penalties instead of people from indigenous communities, for example, could help in making sure that these part these um these uh laws are being followed and used maximized to the and are maximized to the fullest. Other um, regulatory finance measures would be collaboration with e-commerce -plat platforms and financial institutions in order to trace um, to trace the people posting these um, offers for sale of exotic wildlife and also the financial institutions where they bank in. Um, one thing, and I uh, one thing which is also interesting is the San Jose FATF principles, which use which um, recommends the use of. Uh, of specific technologies in order to help um, improve regulatory finance. As someone who works in AI, I, I am very excited for this um, because it, it uses modern technologies that we might not think which is applicable to solving this problem. And lastly, I want to focus on community development as well, which is the third um, transactional intervention. Um, on regulatory finance. When we focus on community development, when we help individuals on the ground um, who are normally the sources of these illegal wildlife trade, when we give them other opportunities like sustainable livelihood and ensure that they are protected from other people who, are, uh, who seek to exploit the natural resources of these communities, that can strengthen the, the system against illegal wildlife trade. So in sum, uh, that was a 16-minute mark. What, do I, what did I want to talk about? Well, first, IWT is a global problem which affects developing countries even more because of the resource first. Number two, ASEAN is gravely affected by IWT and we need to do something about it. And number three, we can use regulatory finance instruments to counter IWT that means that we could combine law and economics to help solve these persistent social challenges. And so my final part, what are the next steps? So I'm not stopping with this paper, and I don't think we should all just stop with one paper. I think Alex should continue writing about the uh, gold in Suriname, uh, in Suriname, and Bilal could, should continue writing about Hawala, and I'm eager to introduce them to people in the economic sector. Uh, in the field of economics uh, to help um, brainstorm ideas. And this is what I'm doing too. I want to, in my PhD, in my field of study, at least for the next four years, I'm go I plan to do vertical and horizontal studies to improve laws. Vertical, meaning that I want to improve the current system right now, which means exploring risk-based legal strategy, um, mean improving um improving the design of the laws so that economic incentives and disincentives are in place. I also want to look at um, international law and the bans, because sometimes when we think of bans, we think that's a great idea. But at the end of the day, what happens is if, the, if we ban something and there's a space between the ban, people would actually start buying more before the ban takes place. And that could increase the possibility of these animals or plants 
um, being uh, even more threatened precisely because we put the ban in place. So now I will I, I seek in that particular paper to provide economic evidence for that. And of course, are livelihood projects effective against illegal wildlife trade? We look at on the ground communities to see whether um, these livelihood projects are really effective against IWT. And that's how we can ensure that global justice actually works because we want to not only say global justice from the perspective of people like us who are comfortable in our own homes, but also from the perspective of smaller communities who are actually facing these problems every day because it is how they live. And horizontal studies that I would want to do, meaning that I want to explore, like this paper today, I want to explore how different fields of law can contribute. So for example, my paper, um, which we submitted yesterday, um, is the illegal wildlife trade and its effects on human rights. And another upcoming paper, what international cultural frameworks can you use to support the Convention on the Protection of Endangered Species? So all in all, this is my 19th, um, this is my 19th minute. I have 30 seconds to go. All in all, what do we want to do at the end of the day? Um, well, what I want to remind everyone is that I know it's hard to care for something that we don't necessarily face every day. Again, I don't know if you have a seal or a penguin or I don't in your backyards. It's, it's just really difficult. But at the end of the day, IWT is inescapably a global problem which affects all of us um, environmentally, economically, social, politically. And this is something that not just me, hopefully, but also all the people in this room and hopefully all the people who are listening and who will listen to this, um, to this forum in the future can help give contribute their ideas a little bit effort in order to solve this global challenge. Thank you very much and um, have a good day, everyone. Thank you, Chad. Another very good overview of uh, a winning uh, essay. <clears throat> Looking at uh, an issue that uh, we hadn't seen a lot of uh, papers on uh, in previous years. So again, well-researched, well-written, and looking at an issue that is far larger than most people would probably guess. And it has also, the it's not just the uh, effect on the animals themselves, but the larger social impacts, um, environmental uh, impacts, the impacts on ecosystems where these animals uh, uh, normally habitat. So it's a, it was a very uh, uh, good uh, look into this particular area of illicit activity.